What's up, everybody? Today we have a very interesting episode. Uh, lots of rapid fire styled questions. Um, Bryce, how are you doing? You want to give them the lowdown on, on what we're getting into today? I'm giddy about this. What's <laughs> up, too, everybody? Dude. Welcome to the Human Evolution Project. We are in season three, and we've accumulated a few questions from our subscribers and our followers. And people have submitted a bunch of questions that they would like Mizba and I to kind of spitball today. And so what we were thinking I love these. is, yeah, it's going to be super fun. I'm giddy. I'm excited. Uh, I'm also very curious. I think you have a world of knowledge and storytelling that you know, we haven't accessed yet that we'll be able to kind of share and pull from. And so I'm excited for our audience to, to listen a little bit here. It'll be spon spontaneous. And we're pulling some questions from... You know, people that have reached out and said, hey, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And, you know, the opportunity to kind of accumulate all of those questions and share them with you guys today on this episode, I think will be very, very fun. And uh, Mizba, first, I want to hear what are your thoughts on this style? And oh, second, all right. I'll, I'll give you question number one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I love this style. I've done it on some other shows like Look Good Move Well inside the mind. Uh, some of my clients also utilize this format. I personally think it's <clears throat> one of the funnest things that you could add to a show because usually podcasting is this one way thing, right? We're speaking into a mic, it's going out to people. But when people actually reach out, we get to play it, we get to speak it like they like, it sparks because of that. And we get to have this kind of dialogue. It's not, it's uh, obviously a little more special. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous because I haven't been on this side for a little bit where you're like, you know, not the interviewer or whatever, but uh, I'm sure. sure like same thing for you. So this is going to be a good uh, back and forth and um, It'll I don't be know, incredibly let's, let's fun. do it. I also want to share with our listeners today, you know, sometimes when you press that record button, things change and unless you podcast <laughs> yeah, and you work in the TV space, um, you know, you don't always understand that. And so we're going to be spitballing questions. Uh, the answers are not law. They're not, you know, they shouldn't be used out of context to judge us. <laughs> You're the right. things that are coming this to mind, we're never people that, yeah, for sure. We're never people that, you know, try to tell you what to do. We try to share our advice. We try to pull from authors and poets and creatives to try to integrate, you know, something that's appropriate, little nuggets for people to pull from. And so starting things off, man, as we, as we kind of warm up, Mizba, what are you most looking forward to this week? Oh, you know what? I really love that you asked me this question because this has become kind of the central like journal prompt that I try to open up every morning with now. And mm -hmm. I try and I didn't realize the value of this the first time around that I heard it. But oddly enough, dude, it, uh, it, it, I heard um, Mark Zuckerberg on Lex Friedman. Uh, wait, yeah, <clears throat> Mark Zuckerberg on Lex Friedman's podcast, and it was kind of um, obviously like you have this vision of who Mark Zuckerberg is, and not saying he's a saint or anything, but like there is a humanizing aspect to him in that interview. And one of the things he says that's very important for him that he suggests as advice for people is like always have a thing that's like, what are you excited about? What are you most looking forward to? And I noticed that like Elon Musk was the same way. That's the first time around that I heard that, uh, like in a different way, be excited about the future. What makes you excited about getting out of bed the next morning? It's the same way of saying that same thing. So anyways, uh, I appreciate the question. Um, this week, I think I am most looking forward to, um, publishing and recording a couple videos i know that sounds crazy but like i feel like it's been so hard to get into this flow for me and and like in a way that i love you know where it's like everything feels right there's always something like you're like oh, okay i got myself to sit down in this but like the lighting's not great or like the sound was terrible on this like something's always up right but like something where i feel i finally feel the synchronicity around what i'm doing um with making these videos i have people submitting questions right that that again for me is like really rewarding they're they're like asking me things i didn't think about like hey show me how to use convert kit and like build an email list you know how and it's and being i can tell it's inspired by like 
they're on my list and they're getting my emails and getting to see that too. So that's kind of what keeps me going with making this stuff. And so I think I'm just, I'm giving it the higher priority, you know, podcasting and making videos. And uh, this is like week, I don't know, two, three that I feel like, all right, let's do this, you know. I dig it, man. Carl Paoli had a cool video that he submitted or put online yesterday around just the authenticity. He was like, you know, every time I make a video, I try so hard to make it perfect. And I try so hard to make the lighting and my verbiage. And it takes me so much longer than it probably should. And so this is me submitting a video, doing the pe the best I can. And it's one take. And I thought that was like yeah. a cool, just authentic, patient, humbling way of sharing, you know, the video. Cause we always see the product or the end result or what we're most proud of. And I thought it was cool that he was just like vulnerable around like, this shit takes me a lot longer than you all think. <laughs> Dude, I love watching these videos that are behind the scenes of YouTube videos. Like how, hey, look, watch me make this. And mm -hmm. when you watch that and it's of these really big YouTubers, you're like, wow, it takes them just as long. They're messing up just as much. It's just, mm -hmm. it's edited out, you know. Um, that's kind of one thing I appreciate about podcasting over YouTube is this like, uh, for non formal, it's not formal, right? Where YouTube is a little more formal. It's like, give me every, for every second that I'm watching, this better be worth it. Uh, versus podcasting is the same way, but there's a little more patience. There's a little, little more leeway because maybe you're getting to do other things. So you feel like, all right, let me play this out. Let me see how this goes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, 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 I really appreciate that. Um, I don't know about both mediums and kind of, uh, it's kind of the new writing, you know, like writing still, I love it. And I, I, I am enjoying that part too, like getting to kind of write more. Um, but it's kind of like consume like people consuming. I feel like it, a lot of it is, I don't know, happening through video and audio. So I feel excited I about it. It's really like, how powerful do you bring these words to us... life, you know? Yeah, I think writing's really powerful and gives us the opportunity to like share our thoughts and brain dump. But my challenge with writing is my same challenge with text message. Sometimes tone gets misunderstood. I always try to like soften yeah. it depending on what I'm trying to say. Like it's one of those things that you don't get to see body language, you don't get to hear how it's said, why it's said, and just the frequency at which it's said. And sometimes you get to hear that within podcasting. You can recognize the volatility or the passiveness behind the communication. And I, th I think that makes it a little bit more special. Sometimes when it's written down, it feels like that's law. Now it's mm -hmm. forever there. And it's like, well, yeah, according to legal structure, but we're, we're complex creatures having a human experience. And sometimes, you know, we're going to flip flop, we're going to change direction, we're going to make a U-turn. And that's okay. That's special. That allows us to justify why we thought the way we thought and why we currently think the way we do now. And I think that's the exact thing that makes good writing noticeable uh, and why it's so hard, right, is because you have to stand out from all of those downsides that you just mentioned to compete mm -hmm. with the audio and video aspect that can possibly do a better job of delivering tone and things like that so that's where it kind of weeds out people who you're like all right yeah, writing's not really my thing i don't feel like doing it this way versus people who are like that's kind of their thing i really respect those two i learn a lot from like people who are just writers and i think sometimes i'm like if i had more guests on who would it be probably be more writers and like psychologists you know um just because i like the practice of how they have to do this mundane thing that nobody else sees. That's a longer term project, but it is so crucial to put in those reps every day. How do they do it? Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody's got their own way. It's 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 just like how coaches or athletes kind of do their thing. So, anyways, Isn't that was a tangent. How one question can spark so much dialogue. It really can. I'm like looking at my timer. I'm like, I went definitely over three minutes here, uh, but that was great. That was fun. <laughs> so did I. Um, I'm gonna. I, I want to ask you. Me? Yeah, I want to ask you your um, first one, and this is this is interesting. I'm always curious uh, about this with myself too, but and with other people. But uh, what do people misunderstand about you most? I'm so happy you asked that question. <clears throat> As I've navigated where I'm at currently in my life, 
you know, for the first 25, 26 years, I identified in between my ears as an athlete. And I think pr- learned to problem solve as an athlete, learned to view the world through an athlete lens. And as trauma started to happen in my life, the loss of loved ones, the end of relationships, business struggles, life struggles, injuries, I started to view the world with a slightly different lens and operate at a different frequency. And sometimes I think in the process of that, people don't always understand like, what is your goal? What is your intention? I mean, when I look at my day to day, it's client check-ins in the morning, it's program design, it's podcasting, it's on calls with sponsors, building relationships, genuinely checking in with people and seeing how I can help how we can connect, how I can collaborate with them. And the intentionality is always around impacting the world, not what can I do for you or what can you do for me? It's more so like how can we operate at a similar frequency in order to put something positive out there that has a great benefit for people that may find some use. And I think sometimes what gets misunderstood is this concept of like, oh, he's only doing this for him. Or, you know, this concept around like thinking that training is only about performance or or only about body composition. But training for me now is really about how can I get in the most optimal state so that I can be the best version of me to give that, that best version or better version to other people in the next thing. And in that moment, process, maybe past, present, future, in order to deconstruct some of the the messiness of life sometimes. And so that's a complex answer to, you know, how I feel misunderstood, but it's always with the intention of service, with the intention of putting out love and kindness. But sometimes certain boundaries need to be drawn in each one of the different facets that I choose to participate so that they funnel and have a clear bridge to the next thing and also to create consistency. Sometimes it's not going so hard because you want this to be a little bit of a slow drip where you don't reach that burnout phase. And I think sometimes people misunderstand the choices that are made in in the entrepreneurial endeavors of service because they only view things from their own personal lens or maybe the lens that they previously saw based on pattern recognition. And I think now I've come to peace that when you're on a journey and and a pursuit of trying to do really, in my humble opinion, high level things, you're often going to be misunderstood and that's Mm -hmm. okay. You're right. For a long period of time until all of a sudden everyone acts like you were understood and you are understood the whole time, right? Like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. Of course you invested these endless hours into this but like they were the same people that a few years earlier watching you invest that time seemed like dude what is this dude doing why is he doing that you know uh and and i think you're right there's um that is always going to be there it doesn't matter the medium the business the field of play it could be in you know in sports too you're like the guy like you said like if you're not people are judging you based off of your previous identity, right? So if it was an athlete, they're still judging you by that. But your um, anything you do that's outside of that category is kind of like, uh, I don't know, it is, is opposing in certain circles. And whatever circles you're in and exposed to every day is kind of like our reality, right? It's kind of like what we have to navigate. So it can be totally frustrating when... Uh, that's there but you're it can also be a source of and and i'm sure you can attest to this like fuel where you're just it's like i don't know there's something about it that like pushes you the extra mile uh and it's sweeter there's part of it that's sweeter when it comes around yeah totally a couple things that come to mind there are number one um i love this this quote I i don't i don't know who said it but it's like be so good they can't ignore you And so try your best to keep optimizing the craft. So inevitably, even if you're, you know, in a dark corner 
and you know not noticeable eventually you're going to create something that is of tremendous value Mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be monetary that can be impactful that can make somebody feel good that can help people operate at a better frequency that can just be a perspective and i think it's creating that optimal energy that you can then share with other people because we're, we're human beings. We can feel other people's energy. And I think there's something to that that is a little bit of the magical wonder within the world. And then also realizing that, you know, this humbling component of this journey, which is I'm not that important. We aren't that important. The world is going to continue operating at, at the beat of its own drum and you know, as long as we realize that together, you know, we can continue to positively impact one another and those around us. Um, I think there's a nice humility to that that kind of keeps you going. Yeah, I think you're right. You need you need both. Like if you were fully, all your ideas were supported all the time, you weren't misunderstood. It's kind of like Rocky in Rocky Three where he's got all the money he's like you know he's beaten everybody he's the champ and then all of a sudden he fights uh ivan drago and just gets knocked out like his let his world turns upside down all of a sudden all that goes away it's like you need a little bit of that to maintain the eye of the tiger so uh i'm totally i'm totally with it i i like uh i like this topic and what that question led to for sure that leads me to my next question for you What's your biggest failure and what did you learn from that experience? <laughs> wow. There's a, uh, there's, I guess plenty here, but that's what everybody says. And uh, let me think one that stands out to me, I guess, is this one that I had um, early on when I was, you know, working at a gym, I was specializing, I was coaching CrossFit. I was trying to break my way into the online space and had begun to sp- start doing that but in the local vicinity like one of the first ideas that i like i don't even know why you know why i didn't just sell like i had these this t-shirt idea right that was like okay uh it's gonna be called like barbells for humanity and it was this thing where i was like okay it's gonna change every month like the theme will be based off what's going on that month of breast cancer was, you know, on, in breast cancer month. And then, you know, whatever the next thing was, like we'd find something and like theme the colors and make it something where I had access to a lot of, you know, I was going to competitions and uh, places where like I could distribute it. Anyways, I made a whole LLC with this thing. I freaking <laughs> bought shirts. There was no drop shipping. Like I bought, I had my trunk was dude. My trunk was always full <laughs> of these shirts, like CDs <laughs> that somebody's trying to sell. And like I, I, nobody ever like after the first twenty, you know, nobody bought them. And it was just kind of like the my <laughs> first so look at just. And then I remember the bitterness of like when I because I think this was maybe when I was uh coming to San Diego or uh before I like yeah I I knew I was going to kind of maybe travel for a little bit I was like okay I got to clean out some of this stuff and I remember having to like give away those shirts you know what I mean I was like geez this cause like this is a ridiculous amount of uh like you know what I mean it didn't exist the the features back then of being able to drop ship so easily and now you can like create a shirt you don't need a business entity really for it technically uh, until you start making like a lot of money from it. And then you can uh, have multiple designs without having 10 different shirts actually on hand. So it was a big lesson in terms of like, you know, validate your idea, the power of the first 10, get 10 people to buy it, but also step out of your circle and be able to really kind of like, I call it the advantage of like leaving the friends and family circle and finding the like stranger, like that stranger effect. How do you find someone who doesn't Mm -hmm. know about this and they get excited about it and they do want it. And like, you know, it passed the friends and family test possibly where like people bought it at the, you know, at the gym, the people that really supported what I was doing, which was cool, but it was like, a we- it felt like a wasted opportunity where I like put all this energy into this one time where I could rally against something. And it was like, 
a terrible idea to begin with, you know? So they taught me a lot of things, like also start with a good idea, the importance of that, like just by spending an extra 30 minutes, maybe like drilling down, like, is this a good idea? Can I make this better? Well, one word could change everything, the whole vibe of this. How do I make it? Like, because once you go off and you get lost in the weeds of like executing on this idea, it sucks when you put so much time into it. It wasn't really, you know, a good idea to begin with. And if you just thought about it a little bit more, I think more, you learned a lot, though. It. I feel like it gave you the humility man. for business. Oh yeah, it was my first like real like uh, what a weight like. You know what I mean? It was just every dollar that I invested in that was just like it wasn't like I had all this money to invest. It was like, all right, I'm making my bet on this, and it was a terrible bet. Um, and so it was a good balance <laughs> of like stuff that had worked out for me. Like that was cool. Like I had a little bit of stuff like that, but like there's a good balance of like where it didn't. And I think you're right. I needed like <clears throat> I had to have that to actually learn that lesson painfully enough, where I was like, never again. Uh, those are the ones that usually stick, you know? That's awesome. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's, uh, I know there, I could go on and on, but that is one that really, uh, <laughs> haunts me still as t-shirts. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you, all right. So this one is, uh, has like a slash or towards it or whatever, but like, do you know what star sign you are slash Enneagram type you are? And I hope I'm saying that right. Enne Enneagram. I think I am. Um, I don't have too much knowledge on the astrology component. I am an Aries, I think. Okay. What's well, the date today? Today. Uh, is, today what, is the 17th? March. So yeah. My birthday is the twenty eighth. So something's coming up. Um, Dude. I'm not really sure. So exactly this is your what month. That means does Aries raise some eyebrows for you? You know what's crazy about star types, man, is like I know so much about my own. I feel. But like anything mm -hmm. outside of that, I'm like, I, I know kind of, and and my girlfriends, like I kind of know about that. But outside of that, it's, I don't know too much about the types. Uh, but it's fun to read about them. I'm going to look it up. And it's not always on point. Mine's not really that, like, I don't know. I think it can be at times, but I don't think it's always accurate. Um, the, the Enneagram, man, I've taken uh, that before, but I don't remember my results so no the the personality type thing you just mentioned is uh myers briggs infj is myers briggs which is what i thought it was first yeah, too, but the... enneagram is like a version of that i think but just different okay. it's like type one two three four uh i don't know but basically that's interesting to know so you're you're an infj mm-hmm I've done it like 15 See, that's times more... and it's always been an INFJ. Really? Wow. Because usually there's mm -hmm. a lot of variability on that. A lot of psychologists don't like mm -hmm. that because it's kind of, uh, there's too much, the people put too much weight into it and it isn't also like, it can change based on kind of how, where you are in life and how you're feeling sometimes and things like that too. Totally. Especially when you take it on 16 personalities because it's like, you know, uh how much do you like being around people it's like it's not just like this energizes me or it doesn't it's like kind of not likely likely very likely strongly agree strongly disagree it's like too many choices for you to actually like have a consistent result so there's this lady that i uh knew who she's she's a writer and stuff and she uh she has um, Asperger's and her way of relating to people became uh, Myers-Briggs personality type test where like she can identify within a few minutes of talking to you without you saying anything what type you are and she Seriously? knows exactly that's, yeah wow, her whole scary. thing is just like how they interact and she's very blunt too so like that's kind of the draw where you're like all right she's gonna tell me something like life-changing or something and not just life-changing but kind of like uh she won't hold back like dress things up for you like if you're if you want to hear kind of honest feedback on something she's kind of a a good a good resource mm -hmm. but uh she based on your personality type like she'll save you from like hey this is a bad career choice or this is a terrible 
I don't know, whatever. Like this is a more suitable thing for you. That's interesting. It gives you great insight. You know, oh, just course, just to yeah. jump in back to the Myers Briggs, I think I think it's a valuable test for everybody to take. Not that mm-hmm. it's law, not that it gives you the answer to the world's problems, but just to go a little bit introspective, um, just to define the acronym for people, INFJ. Um, it's introverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging. And it's interesting because I'm extroverted a lot of my life, but I would categorize myself as a trained extrovert where I do get excited to connect with people, but I actually have to use fitness or something to get me in the state to take that on. Um, Mm. My natural default is to, you know, regress and be a little bit uh, on my own. And so that's a, that's a fun one. The intuitive one, I, I definitely feel that consistently. Um, whether that's energy, uh, ob- observation as to you know how people are operating, whether that's a pep in their step or very talkative or very quiet and a little bit more sad, like it's interesting mm-hmm. to observe those things for sure. Uh, the feeling is interesting, going with the gut and kind of using the intuition to kind of manage all the other things. And then the judging is a fascinating one because I think the word judging in our world kind of gets this negative label. But it's more so judging work ethic and character. And, you know, I, I am not somebody that ever tells people what to do, really. But if you don't uh-huh. put your grocery cart away or you can't do the baseline things of trying to be a contributing member to the world, I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> right. Like it, Dude, it's one you of know those what's... things that, like... What's crazy about that uh, type I, that I believe I've heard from very like CEO, CFO type folks where uh, that was their personality type and they recognize that Mm -hmm. in other leaders as being a good, like that. I mean, I think E also is good too, like E, NF uh, version of whatever. Um, You you said INFJ, right? Mm -hmm. What was your type, INFJ? Okay, so the ENFJ, right, is also equally like amazing in business and things like that, partly because of, I think, Mm. that being able to judge character and people and uh, things of that nature, Um, but also having like, you know, the observational intuitive side uh, available too. It's like a great combo. Um, So anyways, that was, uh, that's something I I, uh, was surprised by because I thought you would also be an E. Uh, and I think a lot of people are surprised by that, like yeah, with people not. who podcast or do coaching or anything like that, that's people facing is that they're all extroverts, but most of the time, many of them are introverts that are, you know, get their dose of extrovertness from that activity sometimes, you know, where it's like coaching gives you a great dose of being around people and the extrovertedness of it. Uh, but it's not like you want to live there 24 hours of the day kind of. Yeah, totally. Um, I have a, a really big question for you. And oh, that right, is, yeah. if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with mm-hmm. anyone, alive or, or who's passed away, who would it be and why? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know who I think it would be, oddly enough? My first answer Mm -hmm. to this, I thought would be, and may still stand to be this, right, Um, would be Dave Chappelle, right? And being able to sit down with him and being able to talk to somebody, like he's not somebody who does a lot of interviews and reveals everything on interviews and is a very private person. And I know some people who are like in his world and circle and like get to like chill with him and go to his house and stuff and that's a very like different side of him that i'm sure you get to access and just from the pure like being kind of a goat in the comedy world since he was 14 years old um to kind of absorb anything and everything from being kind of like there like yeah i think without being annoying that would be something i would love to do right but 
<clears throat> my actual answer, I think, after thinking about it a little bit more, a couple milliseconds more, because I didn't it's happening live right now, but it would be Gary Shandling. So Gary Shandling is a comedian and uh, actor, um, TV show host, right? That was kind of in the, I don't know, 60s, 70s, 80s era. Uh, and what really like kind of got me to learn about him was this documentary I watched on a flight by Judd Apatow, who like, has made all the movies, comedy stuff that like you've watched and um, <clears throat> hit after hit, right? And so he, it, this was a four-hour documentary between, uh, but really for me, the first hour and a half was the most valuable because it showed him a side of him that nobody had ever seen, which was like what his childhood was like, how much it was impacted by like, you know, something like the death of his brother. And then also, like, he was a writer, you know, he was an engineer, he was became a comedian, he was so bad at comedy, he was so bad for years, he was so terrible, and there was, like, no hope, but, like, he eventually found his stride, and the whole, like, it showed you journal entries and stuff like that, that, like, I found that so valuable that he journaled and revealed such crazy stuff in his journals, and they showed us that. And um, it's not like, you know, some things are obviously not shown, but like certain parts of how he's talking to himself and what he's going through, you get to like live through that lens as mm. a comedian coming up in that time. And I think he would have an insane uh, amount to share on just relating with people because he was also, he had been there, done that, and also done, been successful at a bunch of other things with a very engineer-like mind. He wasn't particularly great at any of these things. He just kind of had this, I can learn and I can figure it out and tinker. And me and him have the same birthday. I got this book that was like uh, his uh, whatever, uh, based off the documentary, a coffee table book. And I noticed that and I was like, oh, okay, very cool. So um, yeah, he's somebody that oddly I would love to uh, pick his brain because I think uh, he really figured something out with his delivery his story telling style and things like that that's cool i'll have to check that out i'm not as familiar with the with the comedians other than dave Chappelle, so i'll have to check him out for sure yeah he kind of did um because back in that day right you didn't release all your material like material like it is now where it's like every year every two years a comedian has a special it was kind of like you held on to that and you just toured with it like jay leno still has the same like hour, two hours, whatever that he's been doing, because he's never put it on film, right? So he can still mm. do that. And anybody who hasn't seen him will just experience it as the first time. So that was That's kind of the mindset back then where it was more about getting a TV show. And he, he landed his first five minutes or whatever on um, Johnny Carson, right? And then after that, he got his own show, which was like the Larry Sanders show. And it was kind of like, a show about being on a show and doing a talk show and it was very like meta but it was of its time very i don't know like it, it was it, it was a thing and it um you know also his stand-up just got better and better and um yeah he's kind of like he's a legend in one of dave Chappelle's specials at the end of it early on his first two specials on netflix it's kind of like a shout out to gary shanley and his uh family and stuff because that was right around the time that he passed away or whatever so uh his episode with jerry seinfeld is interesting to watch because that's like a, in his older years you get to see him and then also just that documentary is definitely worth watching because it's just like it's What's just a fascinating look for our listeners uh i don't really know i think it's just, just type in gary shandling documentary hbo and i yeah it's on Got i it. believe hbo um and it should come up you'll see it by joe dapatel it's like fire some fire uh sign and he's sitting on a chair he's got like puffy hair like they did back in the 80s um you'll you'll see you'll see what i'm talking about if you have trouble just reach out and let me know and i'll point cool. you to it um okay cool that was a fun question man um okay this is a really really uh good one and i've actually I've asked this one uh, to some people, or not a, this exact one, but a version of this before, and I do find it really fascinating mm -hmm. how, like, uh, like what uh, it tells about 
don't know what people are really into, so I'm excited. Okay, so if you had to write a book tomorrow, what would you write about? Ooh, that's a really good question. Right? Makes uh, you think a little bit. Yeah, I really like No, it absolutely it absolutely does. So not just the title, but what would I write about specifically? Could be the title too. I think a title says a lot. I think it's something that I lean on often that we talk about on here, which is exactly why I feel like we kind of started this podcast, you know, the Human Evolution Project. We spend a lifetime trying to be more human. And I think that is a very challenging concept sometimes because being more human means different things to different people. But at its most organic space, you know, I look at children and and their wonder. I look at their curiosity. I look at how they move and how they can squat and how they crawl, how they play, how they want to, as you said earlier, tinker with things, how they want to touch everything. They want to smell everything. I think I would describe a little bit in a bio, biographical context some of my experiences and then along the way either integrate the human perspective that I, that I have that I'd like to share with people or on an audiobook fashion have some sort of narrative around, hey, this is what I got to experience as a kid playing in a cul-de-sac with my neighbors And here's the biology that I felt and saw. And here are the life lessons that I believe have transferable skills. And here's what I do now that's very similar to that and why I think that way. And things become increasingly more complex as we get older because of responsibility, of capitalism, Mm -hmm. of politics, of relationships, (laughs) of the, the, the ideal societal norms. You're supposed to buy a house. You're supposed to have a car. You're supposed to have insurance. That's called being a responsible adult. But I do see some people challenge those narratives. And I'm not obviously saying they're right or wrong. Totally. But I think what I would write about is a little bit of a biographical narrative around how I believe you can use life lessons as transferable skills to be more be more human and navigate this this messy middle. You know, we come into this world kindly described as subtly perfect. We fuck it up in the middle. And then we leave with this perspective of what we did, what we could have done, what we should have done. Um, or maybe with no regrets at all. Or maybe it's that's a lie that a lot of us tell, right? Oh, I have no regrets. I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do. But did you? Maybe. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that park bench question that I asked you, you know, my biggest fear is sitting on a park bench next to a young person and telling them what I wish I would have done. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, well, why not just pursue it and try to do it? Even if you fail, why not launch the t-shirt company and sell it out of the trunk of your car because you feel like that's your light that you want to shine. And Right. You know, sharing some of my experiences along the way and then integrating hopefully some life lessons or nuggets that other people can translate into their lives and we can create connection and dialogue around being more human and being vulnerable because we all paint this weird picture of perfection. But in reality, we all use the restroom. We all put our pants on the same way. Um, I I don't care what labels you have, titles you have. Uh, education you have your heart beats your heart will stop beating one day you need food water sunlight and some of the other vitamins and minerals and connection and i think there can be a safe space around some of the ways i view the world and how that can relate and cross bridge to others and i just love the format that a book can be like packaging up your thoughts in that way where it time like podcasting serves that same purpose. I think like it was funny that you said, ah, oh, kind of what I'm doing now or what I'm talking about now on Human Evolution Project in a way, um, 
because like you're time stamping it but a book is kind of like a really polished refined version of some of those learnings that i think is fun to go through when it's done well um robert green's daily laws is an example like that book is a consolidation of four five six books he's written over the course of 30 years right and each book takes him like four or five years sometimes to write because of the amount of research that he puts into it and so for him to distill that down created so much value for me where it's like man i'm never gonna actually finish or listen fully through i don't know 40 laws of power or whatever like the book was but like this one section i love and i can't believe i would have missed it if i didn't read it in this like you know distilled down version so um i think it's an intimate space and a way to do things so that's a cool idea and then there's always room for you to like dress things up along the way i feel in books because it's kind of like mm -hmm. your how you like once you've got kind of your raw material and your stories and you know experiences it's like there are ways where frameworks and and processes that you can name and bring life to and make them kind of sticky right where it's like it becomes something that sticks in somebody's mind and that story kind of absorbs a little bit easier so it's a fun like i've never done it maybe one day i don't know but like it seems like a fun uh it, i always admire people who do it and i love hearing the behind the scenes of it all it's fascinating to me yeah for sure man what inspires you and captivates you around wanting to be and practice as a comedian um i you know i've thought about this a lot lately and I think there is, it's not this like professional side of it that intrigues me where, you know, getting to climb up the ladder in that world is what drives things for me. It did for a little bit or it was shiny object syndrome in a format. But what I realized like why I started it, why I continue to do it is because it's kind of like same thing Gary Shandling said was it was almost like a life path or like a spiritual thing for him you know what i mean where it was like the self-development tool where i don't know it's a very interesting scenario to put yourself in uh it's a very like hot i think like there's of course the adrenaline part of it right getting to expose yourself to those environments the high stakes of like oh this could go all wrong or you get kind of the laughs of your life and you and you know that is it can only be accessed that can't be replicated even when you have laugh emojis that are happening from a viral video or something like that but i would say like it's more of kind of yeah like a personal development type of thing where you 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 just as a byproduct of putting reps in you figure out more of like who you are what you want to say how you think about certain things how to read a room how to be i think just more interesting overall when you come back to any other arena because you're ex who else has the experience of getting to do stand up and talk and try to tell jokes and make people laugh at an indian restaurant on valentine's day it's like very few people i mean there's there's hun there might be a hundred a couple hundred but like that experience is even though it's so bad or it can be it's so fun to recall and be able to i can't believe i lived through that you know so i think it's kind of creating stories like that and then also just the power that it gives you like uh the skill wise you know what i mean like it's such a hard out of many things it's a very hard skill to develop and your brain truly changes over the course of 10 years or whatever um as you you can't hack this thing uh like there are shortcuts, but you can't like hack it. You've got to, I don't know. There, there's a, there's a form like a weightlifting Olympic weightlifting three shots, like rawness to it that I appreciate. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think a combination of those things keeps me kind of like always thinking about it, always kind of like what, what I want to say. Um, and it's, it gives me timestamps just like podcasting does to see like how I'm evolving and changing. 
you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, has anything changed since last year? Has my material gotten better? What am I talking about? What's, what do I not want to talk about anymore? Or like, what, uh, what am I discarding? What's actually marinated and turned into something even better? Like, I don't know. It's, uh, I guess growth and seeing kind of me like actualize the skill is what drives me because like um it doesn't feel like i have that do you know what i mean it's not like i walk around like oh yeah like that's accessible all the time the highest version of it um so to be able to live in that pocket the 10 seconds sometimes that you're in like on stage or whatever it's like it's just the whole like how the hell did that happen you know you're deconstructing and you're figuring it out you're trying to replicate it so i don't know it's kind of that chase that keeps me kind of uh interested in it and figuring it out and you just uh i don't know it was kind of like it, it, there's a lot of person it's not like a big deal to everybody else or should be right but it's more of a personal pride thing where you're like when it was so hard for me to be like public speaking maybe in general to be able to go and do that and do time and get to like do it at the uh you know just uh a volume amount of time where you're like not scared of it anymore or you are but like you still do it or you still figure out a way to make it work for you like that part's rewarding you know like getting over the hump of like oh wow i can't believe this is a part of me now and like public speaking is people's like number one fear i think in the u.s mm-hmm. or something like that and uh it's kind of crazy to think about like i mean it's scary but out of everything that's it's crazy that for some people it's that and uh it was for me too and so to be able to kind of conquer it where it's still scary but not as much that's kind of the cool part because that's how you know skills being developed and it's becoming kind of a party you know I love that. You're callousing the fear component, which is enabling you to share the more authentic version of you because you're getting comfortable in the craft. And I think there's also a component of lifetime reps that come through accumulation of, like you said, reading the room, observing the body language, seeing what style of jokes stick and what don't, how Uh to deliver certain information. And you you then also self-reflect and analyze like, what was my body position? How was I standing? Was I, you know, passive? Was I regressing? Was I stoic? Like what, what are all the intangibles that allow for a good delivery and optimal connection to the audience? And that may shift based on demographic or location right. as well. And, and so there's a lot man. of cool intangibles that you mentioned there. You can't, it can't be taught either in the sense that like nobody can give you a roadmap for your personal self on like mm-hmm. a joke might work for my friend, but he writes it for me and it's not going to like hit because it's just not me saying it. It doesn't fit with what people perceive about me. Like there's a lot of little things you just recognize from going up where you're like, Oh, this is what people think or what, how they stereotype me in the first 10 seconds or uh, what makes them tense or what, I don't know. It's just a very like interesting energy to play with that you don't get access to all the time. And so yeah, I, I, I appreciate it and, and the different forms of it. I'm starting, I think, with exploring it and always being a beginner in it. That, like, learning thing is what got me into it and, like, it, how it taught me so much about myself. Exploring all the different facets of it because it's not just on stage anymore. The industry has evolved uh, massively over the past mm-hmm. three years specifically, but over the past 10 years to 20 years even more so um so i don't know it's just kind of uh just like it is for being a trainer it's not just like you're a trainer anymore you got to be a salesperson you got to be a listener you got to be a you know you got to play a lot of roles and hats to be good at what you do in 2022 Mm -hmm. so um i don't know but just kind of exploring that and being in a state of like constantly figuring it out where you're like i have no idea what i'm doing but all right, I think I do. And then all of a sudden that gets demolished by the gig you do. And, you know, it's just the constant push and pull that uh, the desire and then the opposing force to the desire, that battle that keeps happening, you know. Mm-hmm. Let's spitball one more question at each other. And then I also want to just pull a highlight for our listeners, something you said that really stood out to me, which was uh-huh. nobody can give you a roadmap for your personal self. I thought that was really cool when you said that. 
Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, um, I think that's inspiration for like, you're right. Other things, not just stand up, but in stand up, it is the most the live example. People can tell you certain things, but you can only learn. Naval calls it specific knowledge. You can only learn, be learned by doing it, by practicing it, by failing at it, or by apprenticing under somebody. And there's no such thing as really apprenticing under people in comedy. If anything, it's kind of just watching them perform a little bit and absorbing what they're doing and when you watch somebody do two shows for example you know you get to kind of see oh what they change why they change it they're not going to talk to you about that but you learn a lot from seeing that versus a netflix spiced up version that's Mm -hmm. cut up for that right so um i yeah i think it it i just uh the personal development thing comes back where it's like it helps with so many other things approach business and things the same way and see if it works it might not but an element of it is probably good um where there are skills that carry over to where you know i don't know it it makes it makes you a funner person to maybe do business with or something love it man what you got um all right yeah all right let me uh see here okay so what's your favorite productivity hack for freelancers and small business owners love that question Uh, favorite productivity hack is aim low sometimes i've heard people talk about like accomplish the most difficult task first and then it's downhill from there Uh, i disagree i think it's really hard to muster up the energy enthusiasm and the clear headedness to um, just go for it and the analogy that i give is you don't go into the gym and then try to just PR or lift heavy right away. And so I like to aim low. I like to create something that is relatively easy. Like I'm going to make my bed right now. I'm going to get the first task accomplished, stolen from that famous Navy SEAL speech. And that, that creates momentum. I feel like I'm getting wins and behind momentum gives me the wherewithal, the confidence and the enthusiasm and passion to then be like, okay, we're going somewhere. Uh, th- I learned this from that task. I learned that from that task. I had this connection with that person. And I think there's value in in the Pavel Satsulin approach, which is greasing the groove. The low-hanging fruit you can always do every day. If you do that 365 days out of the year across a lifespan, the lifetime reps mathematically equate to more practice, more accomplished mm-hmm. And so when you're looking at productivity, you can't go to bat and try to hit a home run every single time. And if you do, you're probably going to be batting a relatively low percentage unless you're Barry Bonds or Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa or Babe Ruth. And, you know, I I think that's a really good one for people. I also often say this from the world of yoga, just make it to your mat. If you make it to your mat or you make it to the gym or you just, yeah, just show up. And, um, you know, we can obviously layer in later through, you know, self-reflection and more tools in the toolbox around who do you show up as and all those extra um, layers on top of the cake. But if I could give anybody a a very simple piece of advice, it's aim low and that'll, that'll allow you to kind of start and you can always move the goalpost. But if the goalpost is too far, you're probably going to get frustrated and inevitably either want to quit or back off or, you know, there won't be that consistency over time. And so that's a very simple answer that I think will provide a ton of value for people. And they probably, if they're around me, hear me say it all the time. Mm -hmm. It's hard to absorb and actually do sometimes, but like, because you want to do so much and you want to go hard. It's kind of like open season right now where as soon as it is over, everybody's going to be like, going so hard ready for the next one because they're amped up and then it's like a a month later you're toast because you've just been going for like 12 weeks straight Mm -hmm. you know so um i i like that it's like it's really really fascinating to watch people who have aimed low have just kept showing up and through the course of like doing that for the past couple years like watching them grow in different facets has been fascinating where you're like dude that was just through pure like bad repetition even you know or what what Mm -hmm. looked like bad repetition but it added up and eventually you strike gold right it's like the 500th time that you record an episode or make a video like something's happening at that point or 
if you haven't learned something, you have a lot of data too. Be like, what did I? Well, my what's my good, friend Mizba said to me around this concept of specific knowledge. Sometimes you got to <sighs> learn by by doing the task, and that's yeah. pulling from from Naval, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I definitely think that we could sit here and we could study things. We could aim really really high, but unless we get the 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 subtleties and the experience and and the feeling. It's really, really hard, right? You have to let a child ride a bike with training wheels and fall. You have to allow yourself to try to do different things and fail along the way. And a huge secret is when you watch a child learn to walk and they pop up to their feet and they're waddling, they start building momentum and then they face plant. Well, through face plant, they get frustrated. They cry, mm -hmm. they hurt themselves. And then they, what do they do? They want to try again. And they don't get so obsessed around, oh, failure, I'm bad, I suck. They're like, no, I got to taste what it was like to sort of walk with this, this thing that gives you freedom that allows you to go from point A to point B. And I see the adults doing it. Now I want to do it. And then through practice, what happens? The art of doing, the specific knowledge gets accumulated. And I think a lot of us get so stuck in, you know, fearing the catastrophic failure that we don't actually really want to start and sometimes when you just start as long as it's not too big of a failure and it's responsible of course you build some momentum and then you can always layer on top of that momentum and create more in the future and my final question for you my friend what is the greatest piece of advice that you've ever received and how do you think that can impact people now? Oh, wow. That is uh, the greatest piece of, I don't know, man. There's there's a lot of advice, I guess, I've received. I'm trying to match it to, I guess, a specific facet that has hit me hard where I, like, I haven't, mm, I don't know, forgotten about it. Uh I don't know, and I have free reign here. It can be any category. Any category, maybe one that triages some of the others. The one that is the umbrella over, you know, a lot of the different hats that you wear in your life. Yeah. Um, I guess it wasn't like a direct uh, piece of advice, right? But it was more so like observing and learning through like a book and seeing a story told about somebody and then connecting that story back to something I heard my dad say. Uh, mm -hmm. And at a young age, kind of like me absorbing, in my teens absorbing this, but it was basically Warren Buffett, right? He had said that the best investment he had made was a $100 communication course that he took somewhere uh, or public speaking course or something that then out of everything he's invested paid off the most. Like it allowed him to whatever it did, you know, communicate better when closing deals, negotiate, be silent, be patient, listen, um, deliver talks when he had to, like these things he was definitely afraid of. And for me, I took that as like, oh, like if you, one, just investing in something that you have a hunch on, whether it's through time or energy or money, sweat, anything like do it because you never know and it sometimes is not that expensive that goes to show you it's like yeah a hundred dollars was a lot maybe for that time for warren but it was also like it's not a million dollars right it was something that a lot of people maybe had access to putting the hundred dollars here or there but he chose to put it in this one skill and i love like that was a great example for me that was like do that on anything you have a hunch on and yes communication is the one skill that uh, you know, I didn't feel like I was great at. And so it also, I had that bias towards it where I was like, oh, it solves everything. It, you know, you can win in business. You can do this, you can do that. And Warren was kind of this example where I absorbed that advice kind of uh, almost as if I got it from him, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. I love that answer, man. I think communication is such an art and how we choose to share that with, varying audiences when trying to you know share our truth in this pursuit of self-actualization and you know trying to better ourselves and better those around us and so i think communication is a really big one that most of us lean on that maybe we don't call it that 
but it's mm-hmm. how we email, how we carry ourselves, how we show up, how we interact with the world. It's all this this subtle art. And I think I think that's a really cool way to kind of wrap this up. And I hope our listeners gained a ton of value through us kind of spitballing some of these stories. And you realize that if you want to learn and you want to go introspective and you want to move yourself in the right direction, ask better questions. Mm-hmm. And some and sometimes that'll help us navigate the these challenges or messiness. That's why journaling is so popular. That's why meditation is so popular. It forces you to slow down. It forces you to kind of stop the ping pong ball from bouncing around from thought to thought in our brain and allow us to just focus on one thing and really try to think about how that one question is relevant to our life choices and our relationships and how we choose to you know take one step after the other in this this amazing thing called life it's one of those things that you can't questions you can't help but answer them sometimes even if it's beginning to start to answer them so it's almost like a story a good story or a hook that pulls you in that you can't help but keep watching or um, asking what's next right so it's a great way i agree with you it opens up a pathway and you can access like a different side of how you might answer something that you normally wouldn't just by kind of asking or writing down a question or posing it to yourself in your head so uh, i love that too man great way to end anybody who's listening thank you so much uh like subscribe review wherever you're at um appreciate you joining bryce and i today and one more final thought guys the power of questions is that they don't tell you what to think but they challenge you to think and i think critical thinking is a magical element to our life that will help you navigate this volatile this volatile world that's a great uh i love that anything that also that gives you so much freedom and flexibility right like hey don't do it this way but here's something to explore here's some here are some potential areas and um i don't know you're right it's worth it's a skill worth getting better at is invest in getting good at asking questions and framing better questions whether it's for yourself or for other people uh because i think it it also Mm -hmm. uh, there's value there too right outside of uh just the personal side of it like um I'm sure it, 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 you appear as somebody who can really like listen and unlock and access certain sides of people um, just by the way that you structure something can, uh, I don't know, incite a level of curiosity that is needed in, in the world, I think. For sure, man. Thank you guys for peeling back the layers of the human experience with myself and Mizba. Until next time, see you soon. See you guys. Bye.